What's the image of Morocco in your mind? Is it all desert oases and camel rides? The country is actually a lot more varied than that, both in its topography and its climate. Let's take a look at some of these more temperate regions. Day breaks over my Bedouin camp in the Sahara Desert. It's sunrise here at the edge of the Sahara Desert, and I'm wearing this hat because it is about 45 degrees out. It's December, it's the north of Africa, so it's not hot year round, but it will hopefully get up to about 70 degrees once the sun is high in the sky. So it's time for a bit of recap as I get back on the road. We started out in Casablanca, in episode 2 explored Marrakesh, and then headed over the Atlas Mountains for episode 3, to Warzazate, the canyons and gorges, and all the way down here to the edge of the Sahara Desert. But today we'll be heading back north, up over the Atlas Mountains, through Medelt and Ifrain, on our way to Fez. On today's drive, we're heading out of the rain shadow, into some of the more temperate regions of Morocco, with cooler climates and more moisture. The palm trees soon give way to high savanna, and later to a Mediterranean-type climate that you might see in California, or, well, the Mediterranean. Both the desert region and these mountains are populated primarily by the Berber or Amazigh people, the original ethnic group in Morocco that predates the arrival of Arabs and Islam. While most of the Amazigh today live a modern, settled life, some still choose to live off the grid, like the residents of this tent encampment in the mountains, or the cave-dwelling people in the last episode. The advent of solar power may bring the current generation a level of connectivity not before seen. Particularly up in the mountains, many seem to lead a pastoral life, raising animals like donkey and sheep. In Morocco today, there are three official languages, Arabic, French, and the Berber language of Amazigh. Its script had been banned until a few decades ago, but has made a nationalist resurgence in recent years. In most of the tourist sites and the gas stations and the little convenience stores attached to the gas stations, you'll typically find that they speak either a little bit of English or French or Spanish. So if you have a working use of any of those languages, you're not going to have too much trouble getting by in this country. With the desert now well behind us, we're in Morocco's famed agricultural region. This is Medelt, which takes pride in their apples, as you can see from these themed roundabouts. The region is also known for growing pomegranates and stone fruit like peaches and plums. We continue our travels into one of Morocco's coolest regions, Ifrain National Park. This is where several troops of the Barbary macaque species live, as we're seeing here. The beautiful landscape slowly gives way to this 1930s resort town built by the French, Ifrain. The Moroccan royal family has located their summer palace here in the cool climate. What you will encounter in Morocco is enormous numbers of tourists from Spain, 
France and Italy. It's very easy for them to get over here uh, on a cheap flight. Uh, everything is very inexpensive for them. So every day I run into people uh, speaking Spanish, French, and Italian. Now one of the locals did tell me that it's become very popular for Europeans to come over here and do road trips with camper vans. This one is from Germany. The D is for Deutschland. So they must have put this on the ferry and brought it over from Spain and now they're doing a Moroccan camping trip. Speaking of which, let's talk about budget. Morocco is a budget traveler's paradise. Now, I've reached a point in my life where I'm too old to ever stay at a hostel again. I want my own room, a double bed, a private bathroom, and ideally a full breakfast in the morning. Now, across all my nights here in Morocco, that's cost me, on average, $40 a night. So you can get really decent accommodations uh, with full breakfasts, as I'm showing you right now, for a really reasonable rate. If you've ever done the great American road trip, uh, popping from one day's in to Motel 6 after another and having their you know, burnt coffee in a styrofoam cup every morning, uh, you're gonna find that this is so much nicer uh, than anything like that. Speaking of nice accommodations, let's pass through the gates into Fez and check out my new Riyadh for the night, the Al Mankan Riyadh. As is customary in Morocco, you'll be greeted with a cup of Moroccan mint tea as you settle in. The Al Mankan is a beautiful double courtyard Riyadh style hotel. It's located on a narrow lane in the Medina or Old City. And this room was only costing me $35 a night. Though that was low season, you can expect to spend more outside the winter months. Just down the lane from the Riyadh Al Makan, I discovered the grounds of the restaurant Fez Cafe. This was a pretty beautiful and artistic looking restaurant where I enjoyed a delicious dinner of kebabs. But now it's time to rest before discovering Fez tomorrow. I'm here at the main gate to the entrance of Fez. Now you could call this a medieval city, but it's actually quite ancient. A group of families fleeing Spain came here around 800 AD and rapidly grew the city. Now, with most of its streets only being wide enough for one or two donkey carts to pass, the Fez Medina is the largest urban area in the world in which there are no cars. Near the entrance of Fez's Medina is this 800-year-old madrasa. Now, madrasa means school. Unlike the rural south, the cities of Morocco reflect a mix of Berber and Arab culture, like the architecture of this madrasa. In the Islamic world, art usually doesn't depict people, so the focus is on intricate design and geometric patterns, like these doors and ceramic walls. Now, like when I was in Marrakesh a few days ago, there's a World Cup game today that Morocco is playing in. This one against their close neighbor, Spain. We have no idea how that's going to turn out, but if Marrakesh was any indication, if Morocco wins today, we're going to see pandemonium in the streets here in Fez. Like many ancient walled cities, the Medina area of Fez is divided up into different economic zones where different types of merchants and manufacturing take place, like this part of town where copper works are done. You'll also find that there's a vibrant textile industry.
But what might bring Fez the most international acclaim is leatherworks like these. In fact, the French word for leather, Marocain, comes from the name of Morocco. Here I am at the tannery, or one of many tanneries here in the Medina, where they're dyeing leatherworks. If you've never smelled it before, the aroma of leather tanning is not exactly pleasant. So I leave that part of town in search of food. Now, one thing you'll find in the Medina of both Marrakesh and Fez is that fabulous restaurants and hotels are hidden down impossibly narrow alleyways that weave through tunnels under buildings. But there really is great stuff at the end of the road. And what was really great was this restaurant Dara Team, a family-owned business that for the first half hour I had completely to myself. One of the things I just experienced out in the Medina was a man following me around, insisting that I had to pay a certain shop to enter a particular part of the Medina where they do the leather tanning. Now, you don't have to pay to do this. I found over the years that when the per capita GDP is below $5,000, you're more likely to get a lot of unwanted attention in the country while you're traveling. Local people might see you as a potential cash cow, so you may find that you'll get lots of unsolicited advice, attempts for you to hire people as guides, people trying to steer you into different shops. It can get a little bit annoying over time, but giving a firm no, not making eye contact, walking away, is often a sufficient solution in those situations. Now, let's not forget, like in Marrakesh in episode 2, today is World Cup Day in Morocco. People in the street have been wishing me good luck. I think they think I'm from Spain. The streets are almost dead quiet now because the soccer match is on between Morocco and Spain. It's in the second half and the score is 0-0. Zero to zero and you haven't heard a peep. So that's how you know the Moroccans haven't scored yet. I roamed around for a while, trying to find a place to watch the game. But in this country in which most people don't drink, there are few bars, and the ones that there are were already quite crowded. Eventually, I found a group of women who invited me to watch the game in their private restaurant space. The World Cup has reached kickoff. If they score this next goal, it's over. Morocco wins. Morocco wins. This is the first time Morocco has made it to the final eight in the World Cup. <laughs> One of the things that's funny to me is that I dressed in the national color, which is red, and practically nobody else has. Maybe that's not a thing here. I was inside the medieval walled city when the wind happened. The streets here are no wider than two donkey carts. So we're all funneling in to go through the gate out into the modern part of town.
I'm on what I can only describe as the Champs Elysees of Fez, Morocco, and it is absolute pandemonium. Everybody has come out to celebrate this World Cup victory. Well, the celebration here in Fez is certainly as grand as in Marrakesh a few days ago. And it's probably going to grow even bigger since this is such a historic win for Morocco. Well, I'm back in my hotel. Uh, Morocco was not supposed to win that game. Spain was heavily favored. I, I don't know if anybody here was expecting it, but the crowds, as you can see from the video, are uh, substantially more than they were in Marrakesh for the win a few days ago. I, I was texting my family and I said, it feels like VE day in the streets or Washington DC on the morning of Obama's inauguration. It was the same level of energy and the same number of people. I'm back in my Riyadh now and that'll wrap up Fez for this part of the trip.